Good morning. How is everybody this morning? Enough caffeine. We're going to, the people in the back row, you're going to be okay. All right. So that would be, if you would move your head in the vertical, if you're going to be okay, that would be a good feedback for me. Okay. I see a couple. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. Well, it was, uh, it is a great honor for me to be back here after helping kick off the the academic year for many of you, um, and thanks for ordering up the great weather. Uh, when I was here last August, I talked to all of you about the relationship between you, the professionals, and the profession. And I hope those remarks helped in some small way frame the year for you as you embarked on your journey. Myself, I've had the same amount of time as you have, except a little bit more focus and a few less papers to write, um, about my journey. Admiral Howe spoke to all the, the entire Navy flags and about half of our senior executives a few weeks ago at, the, at our all-flag conference. And he talked about what the profession of arms means to combat effectiveness in war fighting. But then he also talked at his individual level what it meant to be a professional. And he traveled on a journey that I can relate to because a year ago, being a professional to him was making sure your uniform was squared away, making sure that you were physically fit. And so the journey, with the help of many of the folks in this room, the journey has led us in other directions about what it means to be a professional. It's not just about skill sets, it's not just about PT scores, and it's not just about things that in the past have been easily measured. It's the ethical underpinnings that are the true foundation of our profession of arms. So it's with great pleasure that I join this symposium with you about the health of the profession, and more importantly, what's being done across the services, and I might add internationally, what the services and the militaries around the world are doing to reinvigorate our calling. So whenever I talk about the profession, I'm reminded of the caliber of those who contribute to work in this field. The sheer number of PhDs working on the profession is staggering. So it's with a sense of serendipity that one of my staff read a piece in the New Yorker last week that asked if philosophy connotes, Martin, this is going to be, a, it'll turns out okay. We're, yeah, it, it turns out okay. If, if somebody asked in this New Yorker article, did you see it? Okay, so you're okay. It ends well. Is, is philosophy, it, is it great ideas by celebrated thinkers who by the elegance of the presentation illuminate for us the most profound questions? Or does it refer to stuff, and I know this isn't you, that's really, really hard to follow, especially when certain brainiacs insist on reading their turgid prose in a monotone that makes us doubt our very existence. Okay? I'll, I'll leave it for you to decide, and I just, I'm sorry, I just, I didn't do the monotone very well because that's kind of not my thing. But I'll let you be the judge, right? So you all had some exposure to that over the past year. You get to think about it. The health of the profession is an appropriate way to talk about what I've seen in the last 13 months. The way the services are thinking about the profession and executing their strategies to develop it reminds me a bit of a CrossFit regime. There are people looking at ethical stamina. They're talking about agility of decision making. They're talking about the strength of trust. They're talking about the power of vulnerability and the accuracy of leader development. In short, the services are trying to get to a point where the profession serves as a personal trainer of sorts. To move away from the dad bod of underlying technical and tactical expertise covered in a layer of unethical fat. They're providing you with exercises and a box in which to exercise. I want to give you a few examples from across the services, starting right here with Admiral Howe's execution of the leader development strategy. A small group, including many of the folks in the front row, front two rows here, are working with the Navy's 18 tribes to strengthen the elements that we share, right? So what does the overarching profession do to embrace 
and integrate those tribes. So just like a strike group and a striking force integrates each of their tribes to, be, to produce a maximum combat effectiveness, what can we do in our leadership development strategy to make sure we take both the best of our tribes but yet integrate them with the Navy's umbrella strategy so that we have a unifying force in the profession. How do we use things like the special warfare community's teamwork analysis model, for example? That's being done by the leadership of communities with input from senior enlisted, from junior officers, and senior officers. Another of our sea service partners, the Marine Corps. Where are the Marines? I can't tell you. Last time you were in uniform. Okay, so, so free Marines. Okay, so Marine Corps, as you might imagine, is taking a more personalized approach. Um, they have defined squad leaders and their classroom instructors as the main targets as influencers of Marines. So they figure if they're trying to put a new leadership development strategy out there and it starts in a classroom, they better have the instructors on board so they're not you know, using the monotone and kind of just parroting what the Marine Corps thinks is a good idea. So the program, they are renewing their emphasis on leader development. The programs are very selective and the investments are proportional to their impact. Another sea service, the Coast Guard. Do we have any Coast Guards, Coast Guardians in here? At least one person, a couple, couple of you. Okay, the Coast Guard has done an amazing study at the strategic level where they went out and they defined what a culture of respect looks like. They took their performance technology center, took a few people down there, looked around the Coast Guard and compared their, mo they basically did a mission analysis. They said, here's what good looks like, and then they went around the Coast Guard and looked at how the different bases um, compared to that, what good looks like, culture of respect. And they were in the process of debriefing the Commandant of the Coast Guard, so we're really looking forward to those results. Because all too often our lessons learned strategy focuses on the negative lessons learned, so I really applaud both all three, Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard, for what they've done to help us understand what good looks like. Right? A little bit easier with CrossFit, right? Never ever sells there. Well, sometimes they show before and after pictures, but usually when we're trying to sell a, an, a workout routine, we show uh, you know, somebody that's in pretty good shape. So it's helpful to start with what good looks like. The Air Force, okay, so airmen in the room? Okay, great. The Air Force is infusing the conversation about the profession across their, their education and training system from basic military training to commander's courses, courses, from enlisted PME through general officer and senior executive seminars. They have a Dr. Um, Jeff Smith, Who's, um, who's really got a very interesting understanding of what it means to invest in human capital. And he takes, uh, he takes a lot of examples from parenting and, ki and, and his basic message is, hey, it's as much about leaders investing in knowing their airmen as it is airmen taking the time to understand what leadership expects of them. So that's been very, very successful. I think they've briefed over 50,000 airmen across the Air Force, and whenever they come to the Pentagon, they in invite the joint audience. The Army, okay, so where are my soldiers? Okay, great, raise your hands a little higher. Come on, I called on you last, you should have, okay, there, thank you. Okay, so Lieutenant General Brown, uh, out at the Combined Arms Center, which is under TRADOC, and, and the, Army, the Army infrastructure has been outstanding, and they have been really good at sharing what they've learned. Lieutenant General Brown has been, spent the last year and had a, several of his colonels looking at the human dimension, peeling back the layers of what does it mean to be a professional, and what does it mean, what does it require to not just survive in ambiguity and chaos, but to thrive in ambiguity and chaos. And the size of the effort that they have undertaken, um, not only the fact that they have brought in um, 
folks from around the Army, but they've also used the 100 behavioral scientists that the Army Research Institute has, so they bring a pretty good, uh, uh, not a pretty good, a very sound academic underpinning to their work. So lastly, inside the Department of Defense, so right, we had uh, Secretary Carter relieve Secretary Hagel, and then Secretary Carter brought in at the uh, beginning of April, brought the former Undersecretary of the Army, uh, Secretary Carson, Secretary Brad Carson came over from Army. He's the new uh, head of personnel and readiness within the Department of Defense. And he refers to Secretary Carter as a man in a hurry. But I will tell you, Secretary Carson set out on a course to understand what we need to do for the, to develop the force of the future, to make sure that next year, the next five years, the next 10 years, the next 20 years, we understand what we want out of the force of the future and can attack those hard problems. And if you don't think he's a man in a hurry, he gave himself and his task force 120 days to get their report to the Secretary of Defense. If you don't think he's serious about it, I know that we're on day 90, we have 98 days left of those 120 because he starts every meeting with, yep, we're, 100, we're X number of days into our 120 days. So he is intent on not letting the bureaucracy rule the profession. So as I started talking about the profession as a personal trainer of sorts, I briefly described some of the equipment and some of the routines that the profession's putting into place. What I haven't conveyed is the commitment of the people working on these efforts. It was Oliver Wendell Holmes who might have said it best, in the great democracy of self-devotion, private and general stand side by side. The profession of arms is truly a community of practice, which means it's not about people like me standing up here behind a podium, you walking out the door and having not a single thing in your life different. You are a community of practice by virtue of who you decide to engage in conversation, not just here in the academic environment, though that's a really good place to practice. It's about who you engage when you go back out to your operating units. And I would tell you that's actually the easy part. A senior leader was at an offsite last year and talked about going back to that horrible building. He was talking about the five-sided wind tunnel. But I will tell you, the Pentagon is just as good a place to start a conversation, start a community of practice, which is what we've tried to model with my seven-person team. It's just as important to be committed to the profession of arms. It's actually harder when you're on staff duty because you think that you don't have to invest anything in your people. You're just there to get staff work done. That, probably, that model probably needs to be flipped on its head. What about you? What part do you play? What have you done in the past 10 months? You've learned about ethical leadership. You've learned about strategic decision making. What are you going to do with that knowledge? I contend that you as professionals have to demonstrate that motivation and be willing to either join or start a community if you don't see it. If you don't see a community of practice, then it's all about you. Start that community. Talk about it. You're in a position to serve up a steady diet of ethical conversations as opposed to, um, you know, I mean, I'm a Red Sox fan. I admit that every once in a while, the first thing I do is look at the score from last night, okay? But, but the conversations, right, you have time. The conversations engaged in what you've learned over the past year are extraordinarily important. And uh, I, have, I have the odd uh, opportunity to say that Martha Stewart was speaking at a conference I was at earlier this week. And what she actually said is, you know, just because the folks who work for you have different educational levels doesn't mean that they don't deserve the same level of respect. I would contend that just like a workout for me is different than a workout from the best, the, the SEAL or the Marine who's in the best shape, your subordinates deserve the same conversation. It's just that my CrossFit regime might be different from some of your CrossFit regimes. That probably makes sense. So 
I started today talking about the journey of professionalism, and I found this to be a more common theme that you might imagine. I've thought about the journey that Admiral Stockdale took. You know, he wasn't any different than you or I before he was shot down. High degree of intellect, which is I'm sure shared by many of you. He wasn't trying to inculcate philosophy into his ready rooms when he was commander of the air group. He was doing his duty just like the overwhelming majority of those in uniform today do every day. But then an extraordinary event happened and it changed him. These are his words, this is not my analysis, these are his words. It focused him and made him realize what was important. For Admiral Stockdale, it was self-respect, knowing that in the midst of privation, no one could strip that of him. Porter Halliburton, also a POW at the Hanoi Hilton, said for him, the last freedom was the ability to choose. The former British defense attache to the US, Royal Commando General Buster Howes, nearly died. Actually, he did die, in fact, was resuscitated during a water skiing accident. He described, we had a few meetings with him that we really, every, we bared our souls. He said to our office, he needed something to focus on when he was recovering, because it was a slow recovery. A lone tree out on a hill in his native England focused him because it represented his strength, the strength of his family, the strength of his faith, and the strength of his nation. That's what brought him back and kept him going through recovery. These are what psychologists call significant emotional events. I would offer that your journey doesn't need to entail one of these significant emotional events to help you focus. The other way, the far easier path in my humble opinion, is the daily exercise of ethical thought of ethical decision making, and of thinking about who you really are. Psychologists such as Dan Ariely have used experiments and brain scans to prove that reminders such as these will help inoculate against ethical fading. That being said, Aristotle held that the daily exercise of virtues during one's life was part of eudaimonia, the happiness of life. You see, it all does come back to philosophy asking those profound questions. David Brooks, in his new book, The Road to Character, describes two types of virtues. Resume virtues describe how well you work, whereas eulogy virtues describe how well you live. As you might have guessed, he argues that we should spend more time working on our eulogy virtues. So I would tell you to exercise your moral muscles on a daily basis. By doing so, you not only advance yourselves, but you advance our profession of arms. And as a side benefit, you get to enhance your eulogy virtues. Thanks very much.